I did jam 15 fingers in three years, I was not the greatest goalie in soccer, because I don't think that's supposed to happen. <laughs> oh, no. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, I'm so glad, and I feel so honored to have been invited to speak in chapel this semester. It's one of my favorite things about being in the College of Ministry, um, is this opportunity we get to speak to you guys, to speak to the students in chapel. Um, I really love seeing what God's been doing on campus, and in this chapel this semester, I've heard so many testimonies about healings and God just speaking to people, um, and just so many things. God is creating such a hunger in people's hearts this semester, and it's not just right now. God's been doing crazy things on this campus since the 1960s. Also in the 1960s, NASA was on a mission to send a man to the moon. I don't know if you guys knew that. But um, in 1969, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were sent in the Saturn V rocket from Florida to the moon. When Neil and Buzz separated from the main spacecraft to land on the moon's surface, they started to experience some technical difficulties. There were some unknown computer alarms going off. They weren't even sure if they would be able to land. Luckily, Mission Control was able to identify the alarms and assure the men that they could land the lunar module. But there was another issue. They realized they were going to overshoot their targeted landing site. Luckily, they were able to pick a new landing spot. So that's good. They, they, that problem was solved. But as the minutes ticked down and the pair watched the lunar surface getting closer and closer, another problem became clear. They were burning more fuel than they were supposed to be. Due to their overshot landing, they were 30 seconds away from being out of fuel. Luckily. Neil Armstrong was able to land the module on their impromptu landing site. I was stressed, guys. Um, most people know this story of the Apollo 11 and how they landed on the moon. And when Neil Armstrong said his famous line, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think you guys know that. Well, I bet you don't know what Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, said or did on there. When he was on the moon, standing on the moon, looking at the stars and looking at the earth, he read aloud Psalm 8. I'd like to invite you all to be still for a few moments while I read that same psalm. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are thoughtful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word and for the opportunity we have to come together and hear it with one another. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to the things you have to say to us today through this passage. I pray that your scripture would transform our lives, God, that your words would change our hearts and change our minds. I pray that you would make us receptive to your words and to your calling today as we get into this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So... I don't know about you guys, but I think this psalm is truly a testament to God's creation. The beauty of it and the awe of God we experience because of it. Like David points out, the heavens and the stars, they're so amazing. We're looking at creation. Um, psalm 8 is attributed to David, whom God handpicked to be king of Israel. David, who after being anointed as a future king, had to flee from the current king Saul because he was jealous of him and he wanted to kill him. David wrote this psalm. We don't know exactly when there's, but he wrote it and he was likely thinking about all the times that he experienced God's care for him. He experienced God's care in the midst of running from Saul, in the midst of the flourishing of his family and of his kingdom, and in the midst of his sin and his hurt. Um, when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and their first son or first child died, David experienced God's care, even though he messed up really bad. It's clear in this passage that David is perplexed and amazed at how much God cares for him as an individual and how much he cares for him for all of humanity. In the midst of all, this, all the 
beauty of creation and the majesty of God, it can be easy to feel insignificant. But we are created with an identity and an, a purpose that the rest of creation isn't. This passage really begs the question of who am I? In the grand scope of creation and the majesty of God, who am I? Looking at the text again can help us answer this in three ways. The first way we can answer the question, who am I? Is I'm purposely created by God. Psalm 8, 5 through 6 says, You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Both of these verses say, you made them. God made you. He created you. This demonstrates at least some intentionality, doesn't it? It doesn't say you just ended up here or he accidentally created you. <laughs> he accidentally created you and trying to make some other species. You made them. This indicates a relationship and an involvement with his creation of us. It also indicates a sort of pride God would have in us, right? I know for myself, when I create something like this painting um, that'll come on the screen soon, I, I have to take a step back and, and look at it and admire it. Uh, once I finish it, I just look back and say, mm, yeah, like it's that good. <laughs> it's a tree of chickens. You have to love it, guys. <laughs> I feel a connection to it. I feel proud of it. I like to think of God after creating um, humans going, mm, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Which is backed up by scripture, guys. In the creation accounts, after God, each day he says, it was good. It was good. But after he created humans, he said, it was very good. We're very good. That's God language for, mm, yeah. We are a creation of God that he takes pride in and sees himself in. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 talks about God creating humans. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them. God created you, and not just in the sense of him creating Adam and Eve, and then, you know, as a result of everything, you're, you're here. But he created you in, in a personal way. He created you when it was your time. In Psalm 139, 13, the psalmist praises God because he created their innermost being and knit them together in their mother's womb. So God was active in his creation of you. The image of God knitting you together is so personal and so intimate. But I also can't help but picture God with like little glasses on and knitting needles like a little old grandma knitting me together. <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny image, but it's also so intimate seeing that God had a hand in every step of the process of you being here and that he knew you every step of the way. The Genesis 2 account of creation shows a similar but different sort of active involvement in humanity's creation. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. I'm in a class with Dr. Bensall right now, and he was talking about this the other day and describing this action as God kneeling down into the dirt, carefully sculpting a man, and then breathing into him. You can't get much closer or more involved with creating someone than that. If we go back to the idea of the painting, you're involved in every step of that process. You come up with the idea for it. You, get, you gather all the supplies. You prep the canvas if you know what you're doing. Um, and then you paint it, and then you sign it. So this process of God getting down into the dirt is he had the idea. He's like, I need someone to help me rule over this creation. He didn't need it. He wanted someone to help him. And so he knelt down into the dirt, carefully shaped the perfect man shape, and then breathed his life into him, sort of signing him, signing his artwork, making him in his image. This is that same God that spoke the stars and the mountains and the beautiful sunsets into existence, carefully creating a man, carefully creating you. I personally love sunsets. Um, anytime there's a pretty sunset, I have to take a picture of it. This is just a couple of them. Um, but they're so pretty. And two of them were taken in Granger. Two of these pictures were from Granger. So 
Shout out. Um, <laughs> um, but it's crazy to think that in God's eyes, we are this intricate artwork, the way that we would picture these sunsets to be or the way that we would picture one of our own paintings to be. We're an intricate artwork in God's eyes, his art. So who am I? I'm purposely created by God, and I'm purposely positioned by God. Again, Psalm 8, 5, and 6 says, You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Every art, other part of creation is beautiful, and it attests to the power and majesty of God. But only humanity is made a little lower than the angels and is crowned with glory and honor. Only us. When God created man in his image, it meant that all of humankind would have the status of a king. In ancient times, kings were depicted as gods or as images of gods. So saying that we're created in the image of God is saying that we're created as kings. So God created you in his image and crowned you with glory. So we have a royal status. He has set you above the rest of creation and sees you as valuable. So valuable, he sent his son down to earth to die so that he could have eternity with him eventually. God wants all of humanity to have eternal life with him. And he wants all of humanity to eventually truly walk in the glory and honor he created us crowned with. Because we live in a sinful world, we don't always see people walking in this glory and honor. Um, but Hebrews 2 talks about how Jesus was made lower than the angels for a while and was exalted higher than them after he died for the sake of the world. This means that when we decide to dedicate our lives to mirroring the life and ministry of Jesus as described in the Gospels and having a relationship with him, we are made holy and we can walk in those crowns of glory and honor that we're created to walk in. So who am I? I'm purposely created and positioned by God and I'm purposely commissioned by God. Psalm 8, 6 or 8 says, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. We're not created to just exist or just, just vibe and do what makes us happy. God gives us a job. He get, put us in charge of creation. So our job is to steward the rest of creation, which includes other people, um, we have the privilege of basically being in charge of things on the earth, being like the regional managers of creation. So God's like in charge. He's like the CEO. He's in charge of us and of everything. But he gives us power over the other parts of creation. He has the ultimate power. But we're in charge, guys. I swear. <laughs> God works through us to take care of the earth. And he invites us to be a part of his ongoing mission to redeem the whole of his creation. When man sinned, it not only brought separation and human's relationship with God, but all of creation began to suffer because the humans that didn't know God's presence in the same way didn't know how to mediate it properly and care for creation. Or maybe they did know. They did have the right ideas, but they wanted to utilize the resources for their own desires. We don't do that. We never do that. <laughs> Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. When God created man, he told them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and then to subdue it. We're called to have dominion over the earth and to contribute to his well-being. This includes the state of nature. So like, try not to pollute extra. That's a good start. Um, don't go killing animals just for fun. If you're killing them to eat them, do it because they're really tasty. <laughs> And don't just, like, cut down trees left and right for no reason, right? Um, another way we can, another way we're called to, like, contribute to the earth's well-being is by communicating, uh, contributing to the well-being of our communities. We should be engaging in our communities and in our local economies and taking care of the people around us. When we're engaging with our communities, we're helping it thrive. And we're fulfilling our purpose through that. God calls us to take care of, the, of creation and to help the, the earth flourish in his place. And God not only has a, this calling for all of humanity that we're a part of, but he invites us each personally to partner him in a different way. 
he calls us to do certain careers. Like, if, for me, like, I'm called to be a pastor. There's people in here that feel called to, to be a teacher or to be a firefighter or a nurse. Not only are we, like, called to do that, but we get to choose what we do. God gives us the right to choose, and he gives us the right to choose whether or not we partner with him in his mission on the earth. He invites us to partner with him in redeeming his creation. And if we choose not to do that and we continue to do our own thing, it still points to God in a way. Because he still created us and he still called us and he still works through us in that. Part of our mission on earth is connecting with people and building relationships and helping our communities be successful and healthy. So anything that you're called to do or that you choose to do is a part of creation that we're called to have dominion over. So anything you do is for God. Whether or not you're knowingly doing it for God, it's for God and it points people to God. So what is mankind that God is mindful of them? Human beings that he cares for them. Who am I? I'm God's creation, formed by his hands. I'm crowned with glory. I have a purpose, which is to bear God's image and rule over it and take care of creation. I am purposely created, positioned, and commissioned by God. If you're sitting here today and you're searching for your identity or wondering what your purpose is, know that first and foremost you are loved and you are seen. You are an intentionally created child of God whose purpose is to be a part of what God is doing. Engage with people, engage with your communities, and care for the rest of creation. If you're struggling to see your value or your purpose, Find someone after service and pray with them. Get in the word and start to understand your identity as described in the scripture, as described by God. As you go out into this week, think about your place in God's mind as higher than the stars and the sunsets and the mountains. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your words, God, that you've shared with us today. I pray that as we go out into this week and as we go out into our lives, you would speak to us and you would reveal to us the truth of who you've created us to be, God. You would reveal our place in your mind, God, our place in your creation. I pray that we would walk out of here knowing that we are crowned with glory, God. We are purposely created by you, purposely called and commissioned by you, God. That we're not just here to exist, God. We're here for a reason. We're here to worship you and to serve you and to bring glory to you in everything we do. I pray that we would walk in that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.